right, so uh, just for a quick intro, I'm the co-founder of Number Station. Today I'll talk about uh, applying foundation models in the, uh, the modern data stack. Um, and for my background, I have a background in AI. I did my PhD on uh, representation learning at Stanford, uh, doing things like entity resolution, entity linking, data cleaning. Um, and towards the end of my PhD, I started playing with large language models and realized a lot of the work we did during the PhD was basically replaced with LLMs in minutes. So a bit depressing as an observation, but also very exciting. And that's when we decided to start this company. All right, so most people uh, here, I suppose, know about generative AI and foundation models. Uh, before I dive in, I just want to do a quick recap of what these models are and why they're so exciting. So at a high level, large language models uh, are very large neural networks uh, that are trained on massive amounts of unlabeled data. So it could be text, images, videos on the internet, and they're trained with a technique called self-supervised learning. So a big group of models are uh, large autoregressive language models, where the idea is to train the model to predict the next word uh, in a sentence. Um, and essentially with this technique, any sentence on the internet becomes a training example, so that gives us a lot of data to train the model on. Um, and if you've done some NLP, you know that this idea has existed for a while, uh, but what makes these models really unique is their scale. Uh, they're trained on massive amounts of data, they have a massive amount of parameters, and with this increase in size uh, and volumes of data, we've seen some amazing emerging capabilities uh, appear. And so what are these capabilities? Uh, well, the key idea is that a single model can generalize to many downstream tasks uh, using something called in-context learning. So the idea is to take any general purpose task and cast it uh, as a generation task uh, by crafting a prompt for the task that we care about. Um, and then use the model to complete the prompt, which is what it's originally trained for. Uh, so, for instance, here, if I want to predict the capital from the city, I can create a prompt with the instruction, some in-context examples, and ask the model to predict uh, the missing capital from, from this context. And uh, essentially, the model reserves over the prompt context, and that's why uh, we call this in-context learning. Uh, and then I can take this prompt, apply it to many more inputs in my data set, uh, or I can create a new prompt for a new data set, but essentially the, the idea is that the underlying model doesn't change. The weights remain the same and it's frozen after the pre-training phase. So what does this mean in terms of AI applications? Well, there's a huge paradigm shift compared to how we used to build AI systems and how we're building AI systems today. Uh, so one key implication of this is that there's no task-specific fine-tuning task-specific data labeling, which takes a long time uh, for AI practitioners to build uh, systems with traditional approaches. Uh, and so it makes it very easy to like, manage and uh, uh, prototype pipelines uh, uh, with this approach. And the other bigger piece is uh, access democratization. Before, if I wanted to build an AI system, I had to rely on a team of ML and AI experts, but uh, with foundation model technology, uh, anyone pretty much can start calling these APIs, bring AI capabilities in their apps, prototype products around AI. So it's making AI very accessible to, to everyone. Um, and so we clearly see there's a revolution happening, especially at the Databricks, AI is everywhere. Uh, we've seen a lot of enterprise uh, applications created with like chatbots, content summarization, content generation, copywriting tools, etc. So a lot of things happening uh, in the unstructured data space. Uh, what I want to talk about today is using that technology for structured data, like tabular data that's stored uh, in a warehouse, uh, and specifically talking about the modern data stack. Um, and just for the anecdote, we uh, wrote this paper back in 2021, so way before uh, the chat GPT hype, and uh, the reception in the database community was like, this is science fiction, it's never going to work. Um, especially because these models are really for unstructured data, but we're applying them to structured data tasks, so it didn't really make sense back then. Today, a lot of people are actually using them uh, in the modern data stack, so it's funny to see um, the evolution of uh, LLMs over time. Um, so I'm sure everyone here knows the modern data stack. Sometimes I give this talk to different audiences, so I'll, I'll go quick over this one, but the key idea is that uh, a modern data stack is a set of tools used to uh, collect, process, store, and analyze data. So starting from uh, where the data originates, which could be 
uh, an app like Salesforce or HubSpot. It's then extracted, loaded in a warehouse like Databricks or Snowflake. Uh, it can be transformed and modeled into a semantic layer with something like DBT and ultimately uh, visualized downstream by a business user uh, with something like Tableau or Power BI. And all these tools are really amazing for uh, scalability, knowledge sharing. They've made the process of building data pipelines way, way easier. But there's still a lot of manual work that goes into the process of uh, creating a new data set and cleaning data. Um, and the good news is uh, a lot of this manual work can actually be automated with AI and even more so with foundation models. Um, and just for the context for number station, uh, that's exactly what we're doing. We're bringing this uh, technology in the modern data stack to automate these data intensive workflows. Uh, it's not replacing any of these tools, but rather coming to augment them and bring intelligence layer on top of these uh, amazing tools that already exist to accelerate time to insights. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about how it works in practice, and I'll start with a simple example, which you probably have seen before, which is generating SQL code. Uh, so as you know, business users have to answer questions constantly, things like, uh, what is my churn for the previous quarter? And it takes a lot of time to answer these questions. Usually they have to send uh, tickets or requests to their data engineering team. The answer might not be exactly what they're looking for, so there's a lot of iterations on tuning that SQL. And with an LLM or a foundation model, uh, essentially there's a, an opportunity to make this more self-service, where business users can go and generate the code that they need uh, to answer their business questions. So the way it would work here is um, the business user explains their requests in natural language, provide the schema of the data that they want to run the query on, uh, and then ask the model to generate that code for them, execute that on the data warehouse. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of great demos. This works really well for uh, simple queries. Um, when it comes to like actual production and doing more complex queries that we see in organization, there's a lot of caveats. Uh, one of it is the length of the SQL. Sometimes queries can be extremely long. And the other one is business logic. There's a lot of business logic that needs to go in writing these queries, for instance, I may have like five date columns, which one is the one that I should be using. And so um, uh, capturing that knowledge is, is one challenge to use these models uh, in production. I'll talk about that uh, later in this talk. Uh, another exciting application is data cleaning. So as you know, data is very messy and engineers spend weeks or months creating pipelines to clean the data, do things like uh, removing duplicates, filling missing entries, detecting errors, etc. Uh, and the typical solution to solve this problem is to write, again, a bunch of SQL rules uh, uh, to address all these quality issues. Uh, this works well overall, uh, but the process can be very time consuming and especially these rules can be very brittle to edge cases. So if there's an edge case that I didn't capture as I was writing my code, the pipeline can break once it's in production. So with the foundation model, it's an exciting alternative because these models are way more um, robust and they generalize better than rules. Uh, and essentially the idea is to ask the model to solve the different cleaning tasks by feeding the structured data as a serialized string representation. So here I can say, is there an error in the country? Provide a few in-context examples um, and then ask for the specific example I care about uh, to predict the answer yes or no. And then I can reuse that prompt on my entire data records to clean the data. It's very exciting uh, as an approach. There's a big caveat, which is the scale. Uh, running that model on an entire data warehouse with millions or billions of rows is, is very expensive. So I'll talk about how to approach this type of issues with uh, scalability later. Uh, and another uh, final application I wanted to mention, there's many more, but we only have uh, 20 minutes today. Um, is data linkage. So you may have heard of this problem as entity resolution, data matching. Uh, the key idea is that we want to find links between uh, multiple sources of data that are siloed. Uh, so for instance, I could have data coming from Salesforce, data coming from HubSpot. Uh, uh, my customers are in this data and I want to understand which customers are the same. And this is a very important problem uh, for many businesses, especially for instance, uh, for Salesforce and HubSpot. I don't want to reach out uh, for marketing material for customers that already converted. So it's really important to figure out uh, a unique source of truth out of all the systems. And here again, the, the approach uh, today to solve this problem is crafting a bunch of rules manually using things like uh, fuzzy matching, Levenstein distances. Uh, it can work well for simple cases, but many times uh, the rules are brittle, they're gonna break and, 
and miss on some uh, edge cases. Uh, and it's causing a lot of frustration as well as um, long development cycles for the data engineering teams. So for a foundation model here, again, we can use it and create a prompt for this specific task. Uh, the idea is to feed the two data records in the prompt and ask the model to compare them and say, are these two things the same? The model can say yes or no, uh, these things are the same. I can add more logic in the prompt saying things like, I want the prices to be exactly the same or I don't want the names to be exactly the same. Like we can be more uh, creative there. Uh, but in general, what we found is that uh, the best solution is a mixture of rules for simple things. Like if I have numerical data, I can just use a rule on that. Uh, and then combining that with uh, a foundation models for more complex fields like addresses, names, and, and things that are more textual in nature. All right, so now that we've seen some possibilities of using these models, um, uh, I want to talk about uh, the caveats to use that in production. And especially we've been working on this problem for a while, both at Stanford and Number Station, and we proposed some approaches uh, to address some of the issues that we're going to talk about. All right, so the first caveat, which we touched on briefly, is uh, the scale. As you know, these models are very big, uh, very expensive. Uh, and so if I'm trying to use that on an application that requires a lot of processing, it can be extremely uh, time consuming and extremely um, uh, expensive. So uh, there's two types of approaches and applications. Ones are human in the loop. So let's say I'm trying to build uh, a chat or an assistant, a SQL co-pilot. Um, then like the scale is not so much an issue and I care more about latency, having a fast response rate. Uh, but if the foundation model is operating on my entire data warehouse to predict like on millions or billions of rows, using the out-of-the-box models uh, that have a lot of parameters is just impossible. Like from a cost perspective, uh, time perspective, it's just uh, not a feasible solution. Um, and so how can we approach this, uh, this problem? Uh, there's many possible solutions. One of them is called uh, model distillation. Uh, and so the idea for distillation is to use a very big model to prototype only on a subset of the data and a small set, and then use that prototype to teach a very small model uh, to do the task. Um, and what we found is that with uh, good prototyping uh, and good fine-tuning mechanism, the small model can actually bridge the gap with the big model very easily. Um, and I linked our blog on this topic if you're interested, it's on the, on the website. Uh, there's also like many other solutions uh, to this problem, some more on the system side, so like maximizing the throughput of these systems, um, as well as uh, a simple basic solution, which is do not use the foundation models when it doesn't make sense, only use it when it's really needed. So if my task is simple enough that it can be solved with a, a small set of SQL rules, then I can just use those rules or use the model to generate the rules and infer them from the data rather than uh, using the model to solve the task itself. Um, and it's always better to uh, have the model generate the rules than having to write the rules by hand. So just uh, uh, different ways to, to approach this problem. All right, so challenge number two is about the brittleness. Uh, so as you know, the, the, the prompt can be uh, uh, a bit brittle and the models are sensitive to changes in the prompt. So for instance, if I change the format here by removing a comma, the prediction uh, is going to be different. Uh, and especially the in-context demonstrations as well can be very important. So if I pick my examples uh, randomly versus manually, I can have huge performance difference uh, using these models. And that's really problematic and even more so for uh, applications in the modern data stack where users are not used to uh, probabilistic outputs. They want something deterministic that they can trust. And so when they see these differences, it can break the user trust, so it's, it's a very big issue uh, for data applications. And so how do we solve this? Uh, there's many ongoing works on uh, making prompts uh, more robust. Uh, one is uh, our work on AMA from uh, iClear last year, and the idea is to um, create better prompts uh, with these models and make them uh, more robust. So what we do is uh, take multiple prompts that may be okay prompts, not perfect prompts, use them to get multiple predictions uh, on the uh, given input, and then ensemble the final results, uh, either using weak supervision, a majority vote, anything like that, but getting a more robust final decision about uh, uh, the results. Uh, and we saw that this worked really well uh, with 
improvements, um, performance improvement of up to 39% on some tasks. So uh, it's a, a good approach for addressing some of these brittleness issues. And there's many more things, uh, things like uh, decomposing the prompts with chain of thought reasoning, so helping the model get to the final answer, uh, as well as being smart about how we sample demonstrations. So rather than just taking random in-context demonstrations, being like smarter about how we sample that, and I linked uh, a few interesting research papers there. All right, and the last challenge I'm talking about today um, is uh, the lack of domain-specific knowledge. Uh, so, as you know, these models are trained on uh, public data and uh, they sometimes like some uh, domain-specific or private knowledge uh, that organizations have. Um, and so, for instance, here, if I'm asking the model to generate a query to compute the number of active customers in Q2, there might not be a perfect is active column in my database. And so how is the model supposed to know what I mean by uh, an active customer? We really need to bring that organizational knowledge into the model to solve this task. So to approach this problem, there's two types of solutions. I like to break them down in uh, inference time and training time solutions. Uh, for training time, uh, the idea is to leverage all the knowledge uh, that sits in an organization's logs, metadata, uh, DBT documentation, for instance, or even like PDF documents, and use that to continually pre-train a model and make it aware of that organizational knowledge that it's missing from uh, the public data pre-training. Uh, and this is only possible thanks to all the amazing efforts in the open source community, so models like uh, Dolly that are being, being released by uh, different organizations. So we can start from the checkpoints of these open source models and then continually pre-train to bring that additional knowledge uh, that exists. And I have a blog here as well on number of stations research on, on this topic. And the other types of uh, approaches is uh, inference time solutions. So here, the idea is to bring the knowledge in the context at prediction time. And the way to do this is with things called uh, retrievers. So essentially, for any question, I can retrieve from a knowledge graph or search, uh, elastic search index or even a semantic layer, retrieve the information that I need from that organization to answer the question. And this approach is much easier than doing the continual pre-training. So typically, it's better to start there see how it improves, and then explore the pre-training if it's needed, if like there's more knowledge to capture there. Uh, all right, so this is the end of the talk. I think we have a few more uh, minutes for questions. Just want to say thank you for showing up, uh, and I want to thank my collaborators from uh, Stanford Number Station. And if you want to learn more, feel free to send me an email, or I'll hang out here after the talk if you have any questions. <laughs>